Good morning, everyone. Check, 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 check. Hello, got me? So in case you didn't hear me, I said good morning. You're not supposed to do that as a, a speaker, but I'm not a normal speaker, right? Hey, if you were here last week, uh, you got to experience an early dismissal. Our fire alarms went off, and most of you were cheering because you didn't have to listen to the rest of the sermon. You got out early. You beat the Baptists out there to the, the uh, Mexican restaurant. So um, part of thinking about the fire alarm, and I'll just let you know, so uh, the company in Effingham that does our fire alarm system, we've actually had trouble with it over the last year. It seems like it's connected. Our, our four furnaces up here on the east side, they're connected to the uh, particle. Prevo, I should have had you come up and explain this. The, the particle flex capacitors on the, uh, <laughs> on the furnace. So basically, uh, the furnaces are keyed in to go off if there's particles like smoke detected in the air so it's not feeding the fire. Well, they've been, over the last year, they've been going off, and so Josh Winger and I were closest. He's two blocks this way, I'm a block uh, that way. We get phone call, phone calls when that goes off, and so then we scramble here. We actually have a game now where we try and see who could beat the fire department here. Anyway, fire department police have been very gracious and patient with us as we're trying to figure this out, but basically, hopefully, Barlow came this week and hopefully fixed it so we don't get phone calls anymore, so, or, or glitches, or early dismissals from church. Um, and what was funny is right before the, the sermon, I texted Andrew. I said, hey, Andrew, I might be going long today. Uh, God had other plans, right? And what, what was funny even after that is people were saying, well, was Satan shut, shutting us down or was God trying to tell me something? Well, I don't know. But anyway, this, uh, the sermon, last, last one in our you in five years. So we've been working on these last five weeks on what, where would God want you to be in five years, and trying to map that out. And part of the thing with, if you look back in your life, and I would say maybe even everybody, you come into these times of crisis, which seem to really motivate or force discipline upon you. Like something goes wrong in your life, like a fire alarm, and all of a sudden you've got to reevaluate. And in fact, that's what Andrew and I did uh, this past week. We were kind of reevaluating our, our protocol and working with the security team and all these different groups trying to figure out, are, are we doing the right thing? Are we prepared? Um, but are we prepared for those challenges? And so the preaching team, we sat down four or five months ago and we began discussing this. Does the crisis in our life, does it change us? Or were the things that we were doing before, were they preparing us years in advance to be able to do the right thing? Are most Christians really ready to grow? Are we preparing to grow? Are we ready to expand our influence on the kingdom? Sometimes I wonder, um, you know, just thinking, is our, is our growth incremental growth? Or is it leaps and bounds? And maybe the trap is for some of us, we look at baptism and like, okay, we got dunked and the next thing we expect out of that person or even you is, I should be preaching next Sunday, right? God saved me, I'm just gonna go, I'm swinging for the fences. But if you had to change, the real question is for you individually, what could you do? If you had to change, what could you do? I was even talking to somebody a few weeks ago, and he had to lose weight because he was going to die. The doctor said, listen, the, the way you're going, you will die way sh sooner. And he got motivated, got disciplined, right? And so as a preaching team, we started uh, thinking, uh, how can we threaten our people, <laughs> right, to make them think there is a crisis? Or even can we develop a crisis within us to where we know we've got to change. We know we've got to do something different. And the outcome is the logical next step. Like we can't even choose it. We've just got to do it. And so this question, what does God want to do with you? The main thing I'll be saying over and over this morning is you've got to get yourself ready to say yes. You've got to prepare yourself, your spirit, your mind to say yes to God. I know God very well, 
and see him work. He is always working, and I'll say this again, he's always working in you. Sometimes we have deaf ears. And so I've got to find a way to be prepared for God's move, God's call on my life. So what we're going to do, Hebrews chapter 5, 11 through 14, if you would turn to there, and then later we'll be in First and Second Kings. So we see this in Hebrews chapter 5, 11 through 14. My back screen's not working, so I'm going to turn around. We have much to say uh, about this. Now, if you go to the previous chapters, what he's talking about is Jesus is greater than Moses. Jesus is the, the Melchizedek, the high priest. And he's talking about all these different things on how you can become holy. But he says, the writer says, we have a whole lot to say about this, but it's hard to explain because you are slow to learn. Other versions will say, you are dull of hearing. Again, for now, though, he says there seems to be some dullness among you. And again, this isn't a reference to intelligence. There, there's a dullness here that he's trying to get across, and the Jewish Christians they have become sluggards, apathetic in their spiritual growth. They have more than enough time invested. Here's what he says. He said, in fact... Though by this, ta- this time, you ought to be teachers. Surely by now, being around Christianity and going to all the sermons and all the church services that you've gone to, all this stuff and all this learning, you're not teaching yet? You need someone to teach you the elementary truths of God's Word all over again. You need milk, not solid food. So they've had more than enough time invested. They should be able to teach others by now, but instead they are still spiritual infants. Why? Because they have been slow-moving and lazy in their approach to their faith. Again, this idea of dull of hearing. So instead of teaching, they need to be taught as if they were new converts still to the faith. This word dull of hearing is sluggish, it's dull, it's slow. And we look at the other parts of of Scripture, it says we should imitate Christ, not be hard of heart, like soaking up what Jesus would have us do. Soak up the truth, step out in faith, grow our faith, and imitating Jesus himself. Himself. I talked to a few people who live out on the highway, and I'm kind of in their mix, but if you ever lived on the highway... You know, you got the traffic constantly going, semis, everything. It's like this constant, you know, just cars constantly going. And eventually, you become dull of hearing. You just don't hear it anymore. I'm literally, my back tra- backyard is the railroad tracks. I don't hear the railroad anymore. I don't, not the tracks, I, I don't hear the engine, right? <laughs> I don't hear it going by. I've just become dull. The, the only time I really recognize it, if it stops behind my house and it starts, you know, honking the horn. But all other times, I just, I don't hear it. I've become dull in that hearing. And is it possible that Jesus has called you, you, right, you, as he called you to do something and you've just gotten dull to his prodding, dull to his move, Jesus warned about this a lot, warned about it a lot. Luke 18, or Luke chapter 8, verse 18. Therefore, consider, right, think about very carefully how you listen. Other scriptures pop it in my head. Do not merely listen to the word and deceive yourselves. What? Do what it says. Jesus said, don't, he who has ears to hear, what should you do? Let him hear. So consider carefully, are you even listening? Is there some dullness in your hearing? God, I believe, always working, he's probably told you, here's my son, my daughter, here's your next step of faith. So it goes on, let's go back to uh, uh, Hebrews. So anyone who lives on milk, being still an infant, is not acquainted with the teachings about righteousness. You're going to miss something on this. 
But solid food is for the mature who by constant use have trained themselves to distinguish good from evil. You get this imagery of of a baby, right? An infant. I think a lot of people, unlike me, they think these babies are cute and snuggly, right? Right? I don't get it. But this idea of what uh, the writer here is saying... What if you've been a baby for 15 years? What if your walk with Jesus, you're still in your infancy? You're still hearing the same teaching over and over. All of a sudden, a 15-year-old baby, there's something wrong with it, right? Maybe a disease? Sick? Deformed? Something's, something is not right. And so here he talks about the remedy. The the remedy isn't solid food. The remedy is figuring out how how to actually process the milk. How do you become mature? You take in the milk. You allow the milk to build you up. So milk isn't the problem. Milk actually grows you to become mature. Mature. Milk isn't the problem. It's not, not eating steak isn't the problem either. It is what are you doing with the milk? You've heard it. You just might not be listening. I would say you're not applying it. In fact, one of the dangers of Bible study is, and, and some of you may be in this danger now, you're reading a lot. You're studying a lot. But it seems like you're not getting anywhere. Maybe it's because you become dull of hearing. Maybe God has called you to do something and you've swept that aside or ignored it or just become lazy. And ultimately, as we uh, grow and mature, we do develop this discernment of good and evil. It flows from our inward spiritual senses. So I need you to hear this. This is not an intellectual problem. It's a moral issue. Solid food is for those who have been practicing digesting the milk. They practice discerning good and evil. And so, if you throw throw this up on the screen, the challenge is to consistently do the right things, to prepare yourself for the great things. It's preparing to answer yes when Jesus calls you to your next step. God is working. He is always asking. He is always calling you. Prepare now for that day. Part of that preparation is doing what God has called you to do. And so we don't just jump uh, milk to meat. It's what you do with the word when it comes to you. Again, it's not educational. It's practical. It's not what you know, it's what you take to heart. Bible study is not finished until you live differently. There's a challenge before you. What is God calling you to do? And so we've got to prepare ourselves to say yes to God. When he calls you to do something, to say something, to be somewhere to be a type of person? Yes, God, I will. So we, the problem is, uh, as Americans, we've isolated ourselves so much that we literally can't even practice the milk. So it doesn't surprise me when some of us feel stuck in our faith. We've isolated ourselves. We've isolated ourselves from Jesus. We've isolated ourselves from church. And again, I'll I'll say that. I've been trying to say this a lot. Your church doesn't know you, and frankly, you don't know your church. One of the basic core components of Christianity is you guys being together. And that's not just a meeting house. It's a supporting one another. It's a praying for one another. It's encouraging and warning one another. I'll even say like I did last week. I can't remember second service. It's judging one another. It's confessing our sins to one another. 
And all those things I just listed probably make you a little edgy. Those are the things we've clearly been called to do. That's what a church does. It's who we are. So we hide ourselves from each other. We hide ourselves from the outside world. That way we don't have to be the light. If I don't tell people I'm Christian, then I don't have to feel weird. I, I don't have to share the things that I've been learning about God, that, you know, because I, I don't want to be the weird oddball. So we're silent Christians, right? Secret agents, just keep it on the down low. When Jesus calls us to be the light, you are the light. You're the answer to the world. You're the salt of the earth. You literally are the difference makers in the people's lives around you. But we've isolated ourselves. We've removed ourselves so we don't even have to grow and mature. Another way, I mean, Jesus clearly says, I want you to go and make disciples of all nations, right? You, disciples, go as you go. You're going to go make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, right, for the forgiveness of their sins. And I am with you always, surely to the end of the age, right? So imagine I go tell my boys, right, hey, go clean your room. And they go, they disappear for about an hour, and they come back and say, Dad, I memorized it. I memorized what you said. Go and clean your room. I'm like, but you didn't do it? Like, you just... For an hour and a half, you were sitting in there memorizing what I said instead of cleaning your room? So one of the small things, the milk. God has called us, you Christians, to make disciples. I think that's why the writer of Hebrews said, by now, surely you're teaching. So be a yes man. Some of us so far, we're like, Dad, I even memorized what you said in Greek. And he's like, I don't go make disciples. Again, it's easy to be lazy. It's easy to be unmovable. It's easy to be dull of hearing. So we see this, uh, trying to be a yes man. We, we see this kind of come to play with Elijah and Elisha, right? So this is going back to the Old Testament. Elijah was amazing. I think this guy, I mean, a prophet of God going out, speaking against uh, Baal, uh, uh, Jezebel, you know, it was, he was a power horse for God. The things that he did, uh, he was fed by ravens, he stopped rain, and then he caused it to rain. He res- raised the widow's son from death, he called fire to burn the altar, he calls on fire to kill 50 sh- soldiers, and they, they didn't get the point, so he burned another 50, right? Uh, and again, they, he parts the Jordan. Again, this idea of this guy was a, a mover on God's uh, kingdom. So we get to 1 Kings chapter 19, verses 19 through 20. And so at this point, he's running from Jezebel after he just got done killing 850 prophetess and prophets of Baal. And so now, for some reason, he's scared of Jezebel because she's going to kill him. I don't, I don't get that part. But he goes away, and he's telling God, he's like, God, I, I'm the last one. There's no one else like me. He's like, trust me, I got somebody. There, there's people. So Elijah went from there and found Elisha, son of Shaphat, I say it like that because I don't speak Hebrew. He was plowing with the 12 yoke of oxen, and he himself was driving the 12th pair. This tells us Elisha was a rich man. He had, he had life all figured out. He was, he was great. Had everything going for him. Elijah went up to him and threw his cloak around him. And in this day, when you did that, you were saying, hey, you are my apprentice. You're going to follow me. It's almost be like a... giving you a lightsaber, right? Okay, here you go. Here's your lightsaber. We're going to go learn this together, which would have been way cooler than a cloak. Agreed? Yeah. Yeah. So Elijah went up to him and threw his cloak around him. Elisha then left his oxen and ran after Elijah. And he makes this request. Let me kiss my mother and father goodbye, he said, and then I will come with you. Elijah says, go back. And then ask this question, what have I done to you? I hear Elijah saying, I've given you a call and you're willing to leave all this to follow me? Do you know what you're getting into? (laughs) Do you understand how deep and powerful this is going to be? 
And so we get to um, uh, uh, 19, verse 21. Uh, yes. Oh, no, no, sorry. I'm jumping ahead. So this is later. Sorry. This is later. And uh, no, go back. <laughs> sorry. Go back to 2 Kings. So this is later. Elijah has died. And Jehosha- Jehoshaphat asks, is there no prophet of the Lord here that we may inquire of the Lord through him? An officer of the king of Israel answer- answered, Elisha, son of Shaphat, is here. He used to pour water on the hands of Elisha. Elijah. I just found this out. This is 18 years after the cloak was placed upon Elisha. 18 years he's been washing the hands of Elijah. Just the same thing, over and over, just serving, just doing the milk. What's interesting is we get back to actually the transfer of power, 2 Corinthians, or 2 Kings 2, 9 through 14. When they had crossed, Elijah said to Elisha, tell me what I could do for you before I am taken from you. And here's a beautiful, amazing, powerful request of Elisha. Let me inherit a double portion of your spirit, Elijah replied. Elijah says, you have asked a difficult thing, yet if you see me when I am taken from you, it will not be yours, otherwise not. He's basically saying, that's up to God. But hear the request there. Double portion of the spirit of Elijah? Like, can I be twice as good at yielding, right, or wielding the the lightsaber? Can I be twice as good, twice as much as a servant as you? And part of me thinks, have our requests of God just gotten really small? Commonplace? I believe God has chosen you and I to take over, literally take over the planet. And we become worried about trivial things. But I, Elijah asked for a double portion. Are our requests to God small And so what happens after 18 years of just serving God, doing the small things, here he comes on, and next thing you know, he parts the Jordan, he heals the waters, he calls she-bears out of the forest to maul the stupid teenage boys that are making fun of him because he has a bald head. All bald head guys are like, yeah, right? Um, He heals uh, Naaman, uh, It fills the valley with water, the healing gourds, the oil, the miracle of bread, the cursing of Gehazi with leprosy, the floating axe head. I still don't know what that's all about. He gives the Syrian army of uh, blindness, and then he heals them. How awesome would that be to get everybody's attention, right? You're all blind. Okay, just joking. The fulfilled prophecies, one after another, the resurrection of a man They took this guy after Elisha died. They put Elisha in a tomb. This other guy was dead. They threw him in. He touched the bones of Elisha and then comes back to life. Wow. Yeah, that'd be awesome to have that double portion. But I think sometimes our requests to God have just gotten small. God, will you let me have a nice day? Can I just be completely healthy and have no troubles? Rather than, God, can I, can I be used by you to expand your kingdom? To lead somebody to eternal life in your son? God, I have lost friends. They seem hard-hearted. Would you use me somehow to impact their lives? God, my friends, they're, they're just hellions. Would you let me be a light in their world? So I think for us, coming to this and understanding, getting off of the milk and doing great things for God, again, me in five years, we've got to be a yes man. Every object that remains at rest will stay at rest. It's the first law of motion, isn't it? If you're dull of hearing, the pattern is 
dull of hearing. So how do you get out of that state? What can we say to motivate you or cause discipline within you? I think it's your decision. What is your thing, your next step that God has been calling you to? Things in the universe want to keep doing what it's always been doing. The definition of inertia, the, the Latin word, is lazy. You didn't hear that in first service, Greg. Latin word for inertia is lazy, dull of hearing. Our default move is to not change. And so when we're here at Elm Street, our ultimate goal is when we're preaching the word, we want to present it in a way to where we're not done until you apply it. We've got to feed on the milk, the things God calls us to. We've got to respond to that. We've got to do something with it. And it's this idea of steady progression. Look at Elisha. 18 years, he just washed the hands of Elijah. But then one day, he was called, Elisha, are you ready? He was swinging away. I really believe each and every person in here, God is going to be calling you. So what can we do now to prepare ourselves to be a yes man? Someone asked for your help this week. Maybe that's God's calling on you. Maybe it's time to step up. Ooh, is this it? God, is this the moment you, you've been waiting for? Some of you guys have been stuck. You, you know you need to deepen your faith. You know God wants you to make a difference. I believe there's an answer to getting out of that rut. Some of you guys have been asked, would anybody in here like to pray? Right, that awkward request by every small group leader. Maybe that's a call to lead your group, even in something simple like prayer. Kids, right, at lunch today, you lead the family in prayer. If, if your family doesn't pray at lunch or supper, you do it. If your parents don't want to do it, you be the one. That could be your call. You see someone getting picked on at school. You see a neighbor that needs help. Uh, we're meeting this week. Uh, I, I know the mayor is too, but also the, the ministers in town trying to figure out what do we do with the homeless population? If you see something, you step in. That's probably your call. If you see it, if you hear it, that's when the milk starts to become solid food. It's application. I'm going to leave you with one more thing, and then we're going to pray. John Maxwell said this, improvement doesn't happen in a day, but it happens daily. Keep on keeping on. Keep in God's word. Keep listening keep looking, right things over time will get you where you need to be. And that you in five years, it's not that far off, and it's also not that big of a hill to climb. We've just got to be ready to say yes to Jesus. Let me pray. God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the story, um, the true story of Elijah and Elisha, and that transfer of power, and ultimately Elisha answering the call. God, I know that you've got a call for all of us in here, some next step, some move. May your spirit work on our hearts. May we be humble and receptive to your move. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. This leads us to a time of communion. And what I love about this is Jesus was the yes man. Sometimes I picture God saying, look, look at these people, destined for hell. Jesus, really the only option is you going down to save them. Will you do that? Philippians chapter 2 says, he said, I'll do it. Became obedient to death, death on a cross, giving us this teaching time right to where we can understand more of his love for us, but also his yes to God, but also his yes to you. That you were worth it. You were worth dying for paying for your sins so that you could be reunited with God. And so that's why we celebrate by taking these emblems. You get the bread and the juice, which represent his body and his blood. And even in that, like as you're taking them, we are saying, Jesus, thank you for saying yes. Thank you for being that example. Thank you for leading us to eternal life. So as you go, we got the four stations where you could take those emblems. Again, 
This is a time of remembrance and a time of thankfulness. As you're ready, go take. Let's pray. God, we thank you for your son. Again, his willingness to say yes, to follow through, to doing the unimaginable of hanging on the cross, again, for our sins, taking up the sins of the world, 
and paying for those. So God, we thank you um, and even proclaim glory, honor, and power to him. We thank you for your spirit, how it prods us. May we not be dull of hearing to the spirit moving us and calling us to something. May we be known by you as someone who keeps stepping forward, working towards maturity. So God, I, I pray that you watch over us this week. May we make you proud. We say thank you for your grace and your mercy as we continue doing your will. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So I know, I know this, right? There is something this week that's coming where you need to see, need to hear, and so be prepared to say, yes, here's what I don't like. It always seems like it's the extra grace that God requires, right? It's the thing that just, right? Like there's that battle in there, the battle of truth and grace and trying to figure out how do I best do this as an imitator of Jesus? That could be in your own family, probably at your workplace, right? But we are those imitators. Now let's say this, the people out there, they're watching us all the time. I think that's great, right? Because you are the light of the world, right? You're reflecting Jesus. So for all of us as Christians, right, keep plugging away, keep doing his will. Uh, if you're one of those people that know you need to take your next step in faith and trust in Jesus or you need help or prayer with something like that, I invite you to come down as we dismiss everybody else. You are sent. Get ready. Be prepared to say yes. Amen? You're sent.